Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Pete Brown. I'm with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office, which is a division of the Montana Historical Society. Uh, today, we're gonna you're gonna learn about how to make preservation pencil out. We have three experts here who are gonna speak. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background on each one of them. Uh, Jenny Budenberg is the executive director of Preserve Montana, which is a statewide historic preservation nonprofit working to save and protect Montana's historic buildings and landscapes. Before coming to Montana in 2023, Budenberg served as the Adaptive Reuse Senior Project Administrator for the city and county of Denver, where she established the city's first ever adaptive reuse program. She also served as board president for the Tabor Opera House Preservation Foundation in Leadville. Um, following Jenny will be Peter Jennings. And uh, Peter is a preservation-minded visionary who saw potential in Great Falls' once derelict Arvon block. I think everyone's probably familiar with the Arvon block. Uh, Mr. Jennings is now owner and operator of the Hotel Arvon and Celtic Cowboy Pub, a full-service boutique hotel and Irish pub set in the hotel and livery building that Robert Vaughn established in 1890. And the Arvon is a must-see over at 118 First Avenue South. And last but not least, Heather McMillan. Uh, Heather is an uh, architect. She works for an organization called Homeward, and they're responsible for how many tax credit projects? About 12? Oh, yeah. Uh, preservation, six preservation tax credit projects, projects around the state. Uh, maybe some of you went on the tour of the Bats Block here in town yesterday. That's their latest, and it's coming along great. Um, Anyway, uh, she's going to speak about kind of how to put the financial packages together for these projects to make them pencil out. So, Jenny, you want to kick it off? Thanks for that, Pete. You guys can hear me okay in the back? Great. We got like a, a lot of different mics up here. <laughs> we got ourselves covered. All right, well, thanks for that introduction. We're excited to be here with you guys today. I know you've been absorbing a lot of information. We're at the last session of the day, so we're hoping to make this engaging for you guys. Um, as Pete mentioned, we're going to be speaking with you guys today about making uh, preservation pencil out through historic tax credits. Um, we've already done our introductions. That was lovely. I didn't know you were going to do that, so I had created a whole kind of introduction scenario. Um, but really today what we are going to be doing is providing guidance on how you can use or promote historic tax credits in your own communities in Montana. So we're going to do what we like to consider brief presentations and then follow up with some good Q&A because we do want this to be a really useful um, uh, presentation for you guys or conference session. So here we all are, <laughs> and you'll see us all lined up here, one after the other. Um, as Pete mentioned, I'm with Preserve Montana for more than 35 years. Our statewide nonprofit organization has protected the historic places, traditional landscapes, and cultural heritage across Montana. Uh, we do a lot of different things. One thing we do is we advocate for tools like the historic tax credits to support preservation efforts in communities across Montana. And in this upcoming legislative session in 2025, the state legislature is actually going to vote on whether or not to retain the state historic tax credit. So I'm going to talk with you guys a little bit about that here today and, and hope you might uh, work with us in some of our advocacy that we have ongoing for that. Um, so Pete gave a nice introduction of me. My professional experience with historic tax credit spans nearly 20 years as a nonprofit advocate for both state and federal historic tax credits. I've also been an administrator of state historic tax credits, and I've been an applicant of state historic tax credits. So I've seen it from a lot of different angles. So I'm going to talk with you guys today about why historic tax credits are an essential preservation tool. They not only provide the financial incentive to preserve historic buildings, but they also revitalize communities and spur economic growth. They draw new businesses, they attract new residences or residents, they increase property values, enlarge the tax base, and they help address pressing issues like affordable housing and rural economic development. 
And one rehabilitated building can be a catalyst for communities of all sizes to thrive. So tax credits aren't necessarily for small towns or large towns, rich towns or poor towns. They can be used in a lot of different scenarios. So we're gonna go over the federal historic tax credit and the state historic tax credit here in Montana. We're pretty fortunate to have a state historic tax credit in Montana, not every state does. Uh, the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit was enacted by Congress in 1976, and nearly 20 years later, Montana passed a state historic tax credit called the Credit for Preservation of Historic Buildings in 1997. And these two have a pretty symbiotic relationship with one another. Um, these are just a couple of the major things about these two tax credits. Uh, one, they're both income tax credits, but the Federal Historic Tax Credit is a 20% income tax credit, whereas the Montana Historic Tax Credit is a 5% income tax credit, so a little bit smaller, quite a bit smaller actually. Um, the federal historic tax credit is also transferable, meaning that you could sell that tax credit to somebody. Um, often, I think right now, you could get 91 cents on the dollar for a historic tax credit. So if you didn't have the tax liability, you could then use that money from that person you're syndicating the tax credit with to reinvest in that project or use in some other way. Unfortunately, the Montana State Historic Tax Credit doesn't allow for that transferability, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as I go on here. Um, in both cases, these uh, programs deal with the National Park Service and with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office, which is Pete um, and his crew of people. Uh, but the Federal Historic Tax Credit is administered by the National Park Service. The Montana Historic Tax Credit is administered by the Montana State Historic Preservation Office. But applications will start with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office and they'll make their way up to the National Park Service for review and approval. Importantly, in Montana, if you want to receive the Montana Historic Tax Credit, you have to go through the Federal Historic Tax Credit application process, which is a three-part process. And it can be kind of a big deal. And so that's why we want to do this session here today is we want to be able to talk to you guys about what these tax credits are, how they work, but also give you real life experiences of how they operate on the ground, help you overcome some challenges, and really see what the opportunities are for these. And I should ask, how many people in the room have dealt with historic tax credits? So quite a few, okay. How many is this the first time that you're learning about historic tax credits? Great, welcome. <laughs> So project eligibility for a federal or a state historic tax credit, a building has to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It could be individually listed or it could be contributing to a historic district that's listed in the National Register. It has to be in an income producing use. So it could be multi-unit apartments, for example. It could be a commercial building. The rehabilitation work must be uh, certified by, by the National Park Service, and it has to meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. And this is really a set of guidelines to make sure that any modifications made to historic building are sensitive. So they are retaining the historic character of that building through the process. And then finally, the one that I always need a definition for is the cost of rehabilitation must be substantial by exceeding the building's adjusted basis. And that basically means that the qualified rehabilitation expenditures incurred during the rehab must exceed the greater of $5,000 or the adjusted basis of the building and its structural improvements. So those are the main project eligibility pieces. And today, I'm going to talk a good amount about this report that we put out this past May that was supported by the Montana State Historic Preservation Office to really look into the benefits and the impacts of the Montana State Historic Tax Credit. I've got a hard copy up here if you guys want to sift through that at the end, and you can also find it on our website at preservemontana.org. It's called Investing in Montana, Montana's Historic Preservation Tax Credit. And the report looks at how the tax credit works and its economic and community impacts through the experiences and insights of Montana residents and business owners who have used it. It also compares the Montana Historic Preservation Tax Credit to other tax credit programs to better understand its impacts and opportunities overall. So more than 70% of states have adopted some form of tax incentive to support building reuse, which really proves the utility and success of this preservation policy. It really is an essential tool in historic preservation. 
And because of the symbiotic relationship that we have here in Montana between the federal and Montana historic tax credits, this study really illustrates the impacts of both programs and helps us understand how historic building rehabilitations are benefiting communities in Montana. Montana's historic tax credit is one of the oldest in the country. So woohoo for us, that was really great. Um, along with the federal historic tax credit, it really is that essential tool for revitalizing our communities through the rehabilitation and reuse of historic buildings. So investing in historic buildings means investing in the economic growth and stability of cities and small towns across Montana and the people and the businesses uh, or in the people who live and do business there. So now we can get into some of those actual impacts. The Montana Historic Tax Credit has resulted in an estimated $7.2 million in state historic tax credits and leveraged $144 million in private investment for 69 projects in 18 Montana communities. So that's a lot of numbers <laughs> that we just kind of threw out at you. Um, but this is really impacting a wide variety of different uh, historic buildings, small commercial buildings, multi-unit residential buildings, warehouses, theaters, hotels, train depots, and many other building types have been revitalized with historic tax credits. The tax credit empowers the private sector to save and reinvest in vacant and or underutilized structures at risk of demolition and bring economic growth to small business owners and local communities. Um, Peter's going to dig into this example that you see up on the board as um, Pete had mentioned earlier about the Arvon block. This was a dilapidated and partially vacant building in downtown Great Falls, uh, which has seen amazing revitalization through the tax credit project there. And we'll learn more about that. So here's a nifty little map. The state tax credit program is more active now uh, than ever, both the federal and state historic tax credit in Montana. I think this is still true, but there are currently 13 applications under review. About 13 oh. projects. About, about a dozen, more, more popular than it's ever been, Pete says. <laughs> That's all we need to know. Um, and four projects have been completed uh, since 2023. Uh, the projects underway would bring an estimated $145 million of private investment to Montana, doubling the Montana Historic Tax Credit investment for the past 27 years combined. So it really has grown in popularity and uh, use in the state. Between 1997 and 2022, $2.3 million claimed in Montana historic tax credits leveraged an estimated $128 million of private investment in Montana. And studies show that approximately 75% of a project's economic benefits remain in the community where the buildings are located. So it really does have an impact on the local economy. Uh, the Montana historic tax credit creates a stronger economy for Montana overall. The impacts and benefits of the tax credit were really clear in this report and in the responses that we received from stakeholders. Overall, there was consensus that the tax credit provides many benefits to Montanans and that improvements to it could markedly increase that impact. The tax credit is a determining factor in decision making about whether to undertake a building rehab project. It leverages other project investment to make a project whole. It is a critical piece of a financial stack and often fills a gap. And I think Heather's gonna step us through um, how that looks for the project she's been working on. Um, multiple respondents commented on the difficulty of making projects feasible with rising construction costs, for example. So this is where the tax credit can really help. It also creates local jobs and increases much needed housing units. Rehab projects are often more complex and labor intensive than new construction. So they result in skilled job creation for the rehab itself and create local jobs to serve the new uses activated in the revitalized, house, or revitalized building. An estimated 1600 jobs have been created from Montana historic tax credit projects. And importantly, the tax credit helps meet other social needs that we have, like providing housing for all income levels, including affordable housing, which Heather will also touch upon. The sort tax credit brings new life to languishing buildings, vibrancy to neighborhoods and downtowns, and a boost to civic morale. Uh, building rehab strengthen the local tax base by putting buildings back on property tax rolls. One building rehabilitation can be a catalyst for many more building rehabilitations. And that was the case in Billings. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the railroad district, which at one time was a fairly, um, not a nice place to be. People didn't go down there, but now it's a real vibrant neighborhood with mixed use buildings. And then sometimes one building is just enough to make a difference. Like you see here, the Eureka Community Hall, which is a signature building in that small town that was rehabbed with the use of tax credits in 2022. And that building continues to be a symbol of local civic pride. 
The historic tax credit invests in and improves upon uh, existing infrastructure. I think we often forget this piece, but report stakeholders shared that an essential component of historic buildings is their close proximity to jobs, services, and core community infrastructure, and that benefits occupants and reduces strain on resources. And several tax credit projects also include high performance building strategies that result in buildings retaining historic integrity and operating at dramatically lower costs than conventional new construction. And finally, respondents shared that the state tax credit retains the unique cultural heritage of Montana's communities. And we've been talking a lot about that history in those historic places here at this conference. Investing in Montana's unique historic assets helps boost heritage tourism, and it attracts Montanans and visitors alike to experience and invest in our cities and towns. So 37 out of 50 states offer a tax incentive for historic building rehabilitation. So that's pretty good. Uh, the Montana Historic Tax Credit stands apart from most other state programs in several key ways. So as I had mentioned earlier, it's uh, one of the earliest adopters of the state historic tax credit. So early on, our elected officials realized uh, the benefits of uh, this type of tax credit program to our state and our people. Uh, one of the biggest differences between our program and others is the credit percentage. So Montana's tax credit is currently the lowest rate in the nation. It's kind of a wham wham. <laughs> Uh, the number of tax credit projects is also among the lowest in the nation, so there's obviously a correlation there. Um, some states stipulate a cap on the dollar amount of credits they provide annually per project, taxpayer, or both. But Montana's unique in that it has no cap annually or per project, and that's a really great thing. So we want that to remain. Easily transferable tax credits are an essential uh, a pro part of this program or an effective tax credit program. In some cases, tax credit holders may not have sufficient liability for the size of the credit, reducing the likelihood of the holder undertaking the rehab project and utilizing the state tax credit. Um, we don't currently allow for transferability of the state historic tax credit in Montana, and that's something that could be improved. And then lastly, Montana is unique with its requirement that projects be certified for the federal historic tax credit. Only three other states currently have programs that are linked in this way between the two. And while this can provide a more streamlined program, which I know Pete loves because they've got a lot of stuff that's coming at them, um, some stakeholders uh, mentioned that that was an onerous requirement of the federal tax credit uh, for the state tax credit, and that could imperil the use of the Montana state tax credit. So you can see in uh, this graph here, the increase uh, or the credit percentage. Uh, in this study, we have two main recommendations that we're putting forth. Uh, the first one is to uh, increase the tax credit so it has a bigger, more positive uh, impact. Uh, in this table, you can see how small the Montana uh, tax credit is compared to other programs. So let me see if I can get the, I don't think it's working. Oop. You can probably see, it's right here. <laughs> it's, it's pretty small. <laughs> um, an increase from Montana's current fraction of the federal historic tax credit to at least an equal rate of 20% would greatly increase the financial feasibility of projects and better help meet social needs. And the second recommendation is to allow the Montana historic tax credit to be transferred. Data from the Montana Department of Revenue indicates that some applicants don't have the tax liability um, to be able to use the tax credit. So being able to transfer it either through a third party, through a partner or shareholder, or even just refundable through cash, which actually Colorado just adjusted their state historic tax credit to allow for that, um, would make this a more usable incentive. So this uh, recommendation, along with increasing the tax credit percentage, would enable more rehabilitation projects to be completed and greatly expand the tax credit's return on investment. So the Montana Historic Preservation Tax Credit provides tangible, measurable benefits to Montana's people, neighborhoods, and communities. It really is a powerful tool that incentivizes private investment in the rehab of historic properties in need of a new life, and also revitalization of areas that haven't seen investment in years. Stakeholder quotes seen here on the screen really illustrate the power of the tax credit. Without it, many impactful projects would not be undertaken because they just would not pencil out, and Montana cities and small towns would be the lesser for it. 
So I do want to take the opportunity, as I'd mentioned, um, in the 2025 state legislative session, they are going to consider the retention of the Montana Historic Tax Credit. Um, and it has been recommended by the Revenue Interim Committee that it be retained. So unanimously, that Revenue um, Interim Committee has made that recommendation. And you guys can help ensure that this recommendation passes by reaching out to your state legislators to share the benefits of the state historic tax credit and ask that they support the interim committee recommendation to retain it. And if you guys are interested in doing that, I'm happy to um, provide any guidance or help there. Feel free to reach out to me um, and we can work on that together. And then just one more slide here. So here uh, is a little bit more information or resources to seek more information. As I mentioned, our report um, and some more information on tax credits is on our website. The Montana Historic, uh, State Historic Preservation Office has some amazing resources on their website as well for tax credits, both federal and state. And then the National Park Service um, as well has some really great resources. And in fact, we have a National Park Service um, employee in the back of the room here who's not a tax credit professional, but he at least could help you out a little bit. <laughs> Um, anyway, there's a lot of information for you guys to be able to access. I uh, appreciate you listening to kind of this brief introduction in our study that we recently did. And I'm going to hand it over to Peter for the next piece of the presentation. Thank you. Do you want this? Okay. Yeah. So, can you hear me? I think I'll stand over here and use the screen as my prompt. There we are. So, uh, this presentation is. Um, a recollection from almost 10 years ago at this point. Um, and it's, uh, um, there are some generalities uh, that are repetitions of what Jenny already said um, about uh, qualification for tax credits, rehab tax credits and that sort of thing. And then there are some hyper-specific recollections of my own that I thought, well, that would be important if I were doing this again, um, or if I were someone new to to this process that I would want to know, it, a little heads up. So center button, oops, oops, the other right. Okay, there we are. So uh, this project, um, if, I, if I say any of the specifics, like statutory stuff wrong, just do this and, and then I'll, I'll move on quickly. Uh, my, my understanding of a tax credit project is it either has to get done in a year or done in 60 months. Is that right? Yeah, the project can last longer, but you have a measuring period where you can claim credits against expenses claimed either within um, a year or 60 months. So um, when you sign up for the program, you declare if your project is going to be complete in a year or you, you'll claim your credit for work you start in a year. So you have to, you kind of have to declare your timeline, and uh, I think we aspired to do it in a year, but I'm glad we didn't claim that because, as you can see, it wound up taking us four. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a real education. I I got into this as a guy who loved old buildings and thought, geez, I should come up with some way to save this old building that was probably going to be torn down because it had had decades of roof leaks and the neighborhood hated it, and there were 100 pigeons living in it, and people were complaining about it. And um, so, yeah, I was a real babe in the woods, and uh, it was a steep learning curve. So practical advice on design, construction, and compliance challenges of a complicated tax credit project. Here we go. So first thing, obviously, know the process, um, the three-part application that Jenny already referred to. Um, there's an old picture of the Arvon block. Uh, it's funny they don't have so the 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 far the west side of the building um, you can barely see the kind of double doors opening right here that was a livery stable and then this side um, started out on the ground floor retail and then this upper two floors on this side was always um, back in the day it was rooms but they called it the traveler's rest so it was kind of a hotel but they shared a bathroom down the hall so it was more hostile uh, type of uh, type of arrangement, which we decided not to go for because we didn't feel like we had a market for that. We're not, we're not Amsterdam, we're Great Falls, Montana. So three-part application, uh, you gotta be on the National Register, that's part one. 
and this was part of a this was a contributing building in a district so we had that part that was the easy part for us um now i'm getting into the to the more practical aspects and just so everybody knows um roughly these pictures are before and after so if you kind of get a sense in your head of what we're looking at there that's uh the the entrance of where the double doors would have been um you can see at the end of the the alley there, it's an overhead door, so someone at some point had taken the double barn doors out and put an overhead door in. Um, and so to, to jump forward a little bit, the other two parts of the application, part two, is you describe the historic features, describe the building, and you take photographs of all of the things that you think are important historic features, things that you may or may not effect other than to remodel but you know you may come out looking a little bit different um, you submit a, a map a photo map that shows where the photo was taken and the direction the person was facing and then at the end of the project you do the same thing with your completed building and so it's a really handy uh before and after slideshow so here here we are so anyway um this probably seems obvious and, and maybe goes without saying, but um, it, it's important to make sure the property serves your purpose from a practical perspective. If your goal is just to save a building, um, that's fine, but you gotta come up with a way to use it. So find people who know the industry and can help develop it. As I said, I was just a carpenter. I didn't really have an idea. I've since become a hotelier and a restaurant, restaurateur. Wasn't planning on that. If your goal is to start a business, find the right people to develop the project to fit the business. Write a business plan. And we had that. Uh, one of my former partners um, wrote a good business plan. And, uh, you know, I, I was a, a landlord. And actually, at the time, I was a veterinarian. So I wasn't thinking about starting a vet clinic, but could have happened there, I suppose. Um, but the people, uh, the guy that wrote the business plan came up with an idea of, of an Irish pub and a hotel. And everybody around the table nodded their heads, just like you are. It's like, OK, that sounds like a good idea in this location for this building. Uh, so we did that, and, um, and that was a big help. Um, when, you're, when you're designing this thing based on the purpose of the building, in our case, this particular photo is of the hotel. Um, you want to be super specific. You want to really think about the use of this building down to very small details. And I show that picture um, because I'll show you the next picture. So um, I don't know if that's the same room or not. Doesn't really matter. No, it probably is. Um, but you can see the you can see the bathroom right there. So so the. In the in the Arvon, two historic rooms became one modern hotel room, and so we had to fit the the room itself with the bed became a little bit bigger, um, and then the bathroom took up some of the space. Um, what the 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 real life experience that I had was, we had already sort of reconstructed hallways, and as we go along, you'll you'll see some photos where you can see the, the interior features of the hallway, the windows and doors. And um, it, it, had, it had become a, a really important f facet of this application that all the windows and doors get put back in exactly the same location. Well, when it came time to reconstruct this building and we lifted it up and everything, what we discovered was that 30 years of roof leaks, this whole building, all of the framing had crushed. So none of the studs were long enough, none of the original studs. And um, so it turns out then in looking at the plans, oh, we have doors opening at the, foots of, at the foot of beds and things didn't look very hotel-like. And so we wound up um, filing an amended application. Better move on, I must talk for 10 minutes about application amendments. So next thing, gather the team. Get, get references for, for your key roles, um, developer, architect, architect, contractor, and rehab tax credit consultant. I recommend this highly. Um, this is not, uh, it's not a complicated process, but it is complex. There are a lot of little things. And if you're gonna 
if you're going to sell tax credits, so syndicate the tax credits, um, you darn sure need a consultant that speaks the language and can help you navigate all of the, you know, all of the, um, all of the accountants and all of the lawyers and all of the people who, you know, really play an important part in the process. Uh, understand the fine print. This is a, you know, an, uh, an architect contract, but you'd sign a very similar one with a contractor. And, um, you know, it's, it's important when you get into these things that uh, as the naive, like, guy with a dream, you understand really um, what you're on the hook for. <laughs> it's not just, not just money, but it all boils down to money, right, in the end. And um, so it's, you know, it's good to talk to someone with, uh, with experience. If you, can, if you can get that person for free, if you can't, then hire them. Okay, maybe more obvious advice. Uh, think carefully through the use. I told you this is going to be practical advice, right? Think through the uses and flow of users through the space. This is the basement um, right here. And um, it was one big room. It was where the horses lived. And it may have had separating walls historically. We don't really know. Um, but uh, when we got it, it was one big room. And we wanted to use it for event space. And so, um, you know, you just have to, in, in terms of maintaining these important architectural features, you have to really think hard. Um, where are we going to, how are we going to get people through here? How are we going to ventilate? How are we going to do all of these things? And um, again, this was one of those uh, places where we wound up filing an amended application because the, the first go around um, just had issues that weren't going to work for exactly these feng shui type of things. Okay, so obvious question to ask yourself. Is it going to work? Um, that's our, that's, that's the basement. Um, so we have a, this little gas fireplace that separates um, our small event room from our larger event room. And uh, we'll see what the next picture shows. Okay. Building code options. This was a, a discovery that we made at a very difficult time. We were using one code, and I was just tearing my hair out because we had to do certain things for fire protection, and, oh, you couldn't have people in this room, or you couldn't have this many people in that room, and all this kind of stuff. And I said, how can anybody get anything done You know, with these things? Oh, well, you could change building codes. And I was like, let's change building codes. Is is there a building code that 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 applies to historic buildings turns out there is the international existing building code so if i were to do another project like this that's what i that's where i would start and then see nobody t I, I i skipped the friday late friday session 15 years ago <laughs> so yeah i think what i discovered is that it does provide for safety for occupants i mean it you know it it um it is a, a modern building code, but uh, like rehab tax credits themselves, it emphasizes the historic features and challenges of repurposing to the builder's benefit. This, um, if you remember the last picture, so this illustrates kind of one of the things that we had to do to bring this up to the, to the right safety code. That newel post and the balusters and the railing um, were all on the ground down here and but they weren't so uh, decomposed that we couldn't reuse them, and so we just had to build a little stem wall, and then we could rebuild this thing on top of it. So basically, the same stuff. Yeah, well, I got that from the NPS, so I thought we did a good job. Okay, so more more trouble with code compliance. This is a um, a photo of the under the hotel side basement, and that was probably the gnarliest part of the building, just wet and I think you can even see that that wood is just ready to fall apart. We wound up with some ceiling height issues and so we struggled a little bit with that. Um, but in the end what we wound up doing was um, because we felt like we were kind of at a at a loss the the uh, the plans inspectors reviewers at, at the city 
um, said, no, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. And so finally, I just invited them over. I said, well, you guys got to come over here and tell us what's going to work. Like, help us figure out how this is going to work. And they did. They actually came over. By this time, we had taken up so much of their time. <laughs> they were like, this is going to be faster. I think I may have even offered to buy them a beer. I don't think they took me up on it. But So they, they came over to the Arvon. We sat down, and we figured it out and wound up, I think, I think just this little tiny like chase right here wound up being lower than it should have been. But, you know, with everybody in the room, we all seem to be able to get over it. I don't think any, any rules were broken, maybe just stretched a little. So there's flexibility in levels of modification based on public visibility. And this, this was part of my learning curve um, in this process, exterior, is is number one most important um you really can't make a lot of change to the to the exterior and so i think we adhered to that this is um that was uh, a, a good reproduction of the original sign on the building um then it moves as you move inward and from public to private you get a little bit more flexibility so interior primary that that's where the double barn doors are right now you can see um, this beadboard on the walls, and uh, anyway, we weren't, obviously weren't going to keep an overhead door. And that's the that's the entrance. Well, that's the double door entrance right there. And actually, a lot of this beadboard was recycled, believe it or not. And you can see it on the ceiling there too. Um, interior, secondary, public. Um, this is. The, this is above the pub, but it's what we call the lofts or suites. Um, and then the next photo will show you uh, same space. There's increased flexibility. Same space, same wall there. And we put a, um, a skylight the length of the building right next to that interior load-bearing masonry wall. And it really opens it up. You know, it was a, it was a dark room. Um, this is the... That's like original ceiling joists, but so we had a build. We built a space above it, but it obviously wasn't enough of a um, change that it didn't didn't get passed. Then interior private maximum flexibility. Uh, this is just an example of one of our hotel rooms that we wound up covering up a lot of the window. But you can see that the window's there. I mean, you know. So, it, but we had to fit a bed in. Actually, we had to fit two beds in. Um, damaged or destroyed buildings, I think we, well, we fell into the first category anyway, thankfully. Um, at least 75% of the exterior of the building must be intact to maintain historic des designation and allow rehab tax credits. Our, that was really the saving grace of this project was that the exterior envelope, the masonry part of the building, hadn't failed yet. The, the, the wooden parts um, on the pub side, it's kind of post and beam barn construction and then on the hotel side it was stick frame <clears throat> and um yeah that was ready to go it was all and if really if it had if it had pulling out pulled out like you know joists and things that were that are bearing on the wall um probably just would have been impossible to do <clears throat> but for the, I mean, for the most part those um those ends those wood parts that were interacting with the, the masonry were still in place Um, so, yeah, utilize this again. This is probably um, probably obvious. Utilize available documentation to determine historic appearance of destroyed or damaged features. <clears throat> this was this corner was undoubtedly stone, but um, it was brick. Uh, it was close enough to some of the rest of the building that we were able to just fill that piece in with brick. Thanks. Um, and uh, there were a lot of other. Um, well, so the the hallways that was that was the real feature of the of the building that um, that we had to that we struggled with and had to figure out how we're we going to redo this. So there's a perfect picture of the the mess that we were dealing with. Situation like that, <clears throat> you're probably not going to preserve that plaster and lath. Um, and then you can see, like this is a this is one of those interior windows. So we, so there are, <clears throat> there are three skylights 
yeah, three skylights in the regular like overnight room hotel part, and then two skylights on the other side. And they brought in uh, they brought in natural light back in the day, and then inside the rooms they had curtain rods and curtains, and so people could open it up if they felt comfortable and let let the light in. Um, so those features. Um, we, we, all those windows in our building are frosted, whether or not they're expressed inside the room. Some are not, some are. Um, and so some of the rooms actually you get natural light into the room from the window, but it's, it's frosted. And so you're not seeing people. Um, then some of the, some of the windows and some of the doors, um, the historic doors, we, we had to leave a certain number of historic door doorways. Um, there's no knob there. Actually, there were no knobs. Someone had scrapped the knobs out, which was kind of handy for us because um, I didn't feel like putting knobs back on them because it would have been it would have been confusing for people. Yeah, would have been it would have been loud. Um, and so, you know, the historic doors are probably just barely six feet tall, and then the modern code fire doors are six eight or whatever they are. And uh, so, yeah, this is the this is the term that the the park service when we um when we talk to them about okay how do we do this how do we rebuild these hallways um to and preserve the historic character but make it work for us they said to pre you know we had to reproduce the rhythm and the feel of the historic space and there's that so um yeah we obviously were able to accomplish that you can see the the difference between I think that's one of the historic doorways. So they're, it's pretty obvious that it's not a way in. Um, I've already mentioned, be cautious of retaining really degraded or damaged materials. So that, that balustrade um, and the plaster and lath and that sort of thing, um, that all had to come out. So we rebuilt the, the balustrade and, and it wasn't the type of thing, we didn't have enough of these anyway. Um, these balusters, and so we had had new ones made that were taller and 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 did the job that we needed them to do. Those are the important things to the to the park service when it comes to to replacement of of old with new materials of a significant historical feature. Um, yeah, so in the end, don't try to save money by keeping damaged elements. No, that's all right. Could you not hear any of it? Should I start over? Oh, no. So they've been hearing my whole talk. Lucky them. Um, so yeah, that's a lot better sound, isn't it? So uh, yeah, when in doubt, get opinion from contractors and subs. I it, On this project, I, I used, we used every resource available and um towards towards the end um we had a little gap in in design and um some of the subs really stepped up and helped us come up with designs for things that were going to work yeah uh use of original materials i already referenced my our famous beadboard uh recycling project there was a lot of beadboard in that building there's a lot of hardwood flooring in that project too okay and we've saved some of it not, not much of that um yeah so the the design and the things that you that you replace and and how you choose to do that obviously is a, a judgment call on part of the stakeholders um owners builders shippo and national park service um since Shippo is mentioned right there, I'll just tell you that Pete Brown and I were on the phone an awful lot and a lot of emailing back and forth, and he was a huge help and, uh, you know, probably more hand-holding than he ever thought possible, <laughs> but it, it turned out great, and I appreciate it. I know I've told you that before, but I'll say it publicly now, right? Um, so for for historic materials, obviously, considerations are availability cost, function, longevity, 
and liability. Not sure where the li liability part comes in. Maybe just code and and making sure that I mean you can see this obviously wasn't wasn't part of the the rehab the QRE as we call it qualified rehab expenses. But you always want to be sure that you're um, taking care of folks, guardrails and that sort of thing. So as I as I said earlier, we we had to file two amendments, um, and amendments to the application are are basically a, a repeat of your part two, um, you know, with with the new plan. And so um, you you either reference photos that you already sent in, or you take new photos and you try to explain uh, how it's going to change. Send plans if you have to, um, and here are some reasons that. That plans can change, conditions misunderstood, things behind a wall, uh, new information, and bad ideas. And sometimes that's just the case. And you gotta, you don't wanna. Um, I really uh, um, lost a lot of sleep at times and sweated over these things because I had been kind of trained to believe that if you, uh, if you're honest with the park service, that you could just get ding. They're just gonna say no, you're out. Um, and that's not the case at all. It, it, at least that's what I discovered, um, particularly with uh, the help of the intermediary of the SHPO. Um, everybody wants these projects to succeed, so it's better to just fess up and start the, the dialogue of how do we how do we get a result that we're going to like. As I said, it's a formal written process with photographs to illustrate um, and talk to SHPO. Another photo of the the basement there that's the that's the separating wall that it's a log wall um that uh, obviously wasn't there historically um those logs came out of the little belts Engelman spruce and we built a nice log wall down there and there's what it looks like today well that was about a month ago it turned out to be a nice space um yeah start the process early if you're starting to have doubts and remember to involve your inspecting certifying officials before sending amendment documents just to make sure that your hopes and dreams for the change are going to pass that that uh, um, get over their uh, yardstick as well. So financing, real quick, um, tax credits have value, as mentioned. They can be leveraged as collateral um, for bank loans, that sort of thing, other sources. Um, TIF district, tax increment financing district, tax abatements, we got one. SBA, they often have, uh, um, or sorry, SBA does have uh, low interest, relatively low interest loans um, to business owners. EPA grants, we benefited from that. It was a brownfield, brownfield grant um, for, you know, um, properties that potentially have um, contamination. We had a little bit of asbestos in this building. Bridge loans from local organizations. Um, Great Falls Development Authority provided us with a bridge loan. Then tax credit syndication. Um, as mentioned, uh, you're selling projected credits to a qualified investor. It's a partnership between the developer and the investor that allows the investor to utilize the credits with minimal risk and usually no long-term interest. So in my day, it was a five-year holding period. Um, and in our case, it was D.A. Davidson Company. We're very grateful for them to do it. Obviously, a Montana company, so they were able to use both federal and state. And uh, a big enough tax liability that I think they just wrote it off, you know, used it all in one year, which was fabulous. And there is a national market, and so there are people out there uh, looking for these things. Um, generally, that not always, but I think generally it's expected that, particularly in a in a private project, it's going to get you a little lower offer because they know that you're probably a little bit desperate. Um, but a local investor um, would be able to use the state tax credits. Uh, as I said before, hire a tax credit consultant, help with the legalities of creating the entity that will hold the deed for the required five-year holding period, um, accountants, lawyers. Um, you know they, they can walk you through all of that and these people that invest in these things um generally have no interest not always but generally have no interest in the the business they're interested in the tax credits and they want 
no liability as well. So you sign all kinds of waivers and indemnifications and hold harmlesses and that sort of thing. Uh, yield reality, um, if you're getting above 70%, you're doing well, in my opinion. Um, the developer fee, that's something to, worth mentioning. Um, it's between 2 and 15% of total non-developer qualified rehab expenses, depending on the complexity of the project. So it's sort of this sliding scale where you tell the park, hey, it's like second to last slide, where you tell the park service, yeah, I think my time was worth 5% of this project. And so it's, um, it's not something that you necessarily have to, um, have to itemize. You just say, well, I, you know, I work this hard. I mean, you can, um, that there is some level of, of itemization and that refers to what's down below the reasonableness opinion. So that is an accountant who, who deals in this sort of thing, looking at your project and saying, yeah, that's reasonable. And it's a much longer report than that, but it's a qualified person that can say, yeah, these guys aren't just gouging the system. Talk to veterans of the process and gather the advice. Details small and large can make a difference. So um, these two little name tags um, emerged when we were pressure washing the joists in the basement. And you know it was, it was where the horses lived. So we're assuming that Billy and Banks were horses that lived down in the basement. And so it, they're not visible where the fireplace is. They're right above that. Um, I thought, well, maybe I can pry them out of there. And you can see these enormous nails. Like this is just a little piece of cedar. And I started wrenching on it one day, prying on it one day, and I knew I was going to destroy it. So I just took the Park Service's advice and left it alone. Whoops. Now I'll deliver Heather's talk. Cool. All right. Another round of applause for Peter. Okay. I mean, seriously, I, I've had a, a, a tax credit crush on the Arvon for like a decade. And it was really fun when Jenny decided that uh, we needed to be do this dog and pony show together. So um, my name is Heather McMillan, and I'm the project development director for Homeward. Um, we are a private 501c3. We're a community housing development organization designated by HUD and a whole bunch of other stuff that we'll all speed through. Um, we do housing across the state of Montana. We develop it, we build it, we preserve it, uh, we rehabilitate it. One of our favorite things to do is use uh, historic buildings and do an adaptive reuse. So we're gonna talk about that today. My partner on the project is NeighborWorks Great Falls. Carol's in the room. Sherry was supposed to be in the room, but she probably got waylaid. Um, They're a local Chodo community housing development organization, 501c3, and we're partners on this project. The BATS block building, some of you guys got to see it yesterday. Um, it is under construction right now, just so you know. Um, we are full on in the heat of the battle um, that Peter described. And so I'm gonna go a little bit quick through this part and then we're gonna talk about a housing finance structure capital stack that most of you will never use. But I'll talk about it and it'll explain how we use it. Uh, the Bats Block is a building that is in downtown Great Falls, but it was one block south of the Central Business District. Uh, it's a three-story building, um, and we are turning it, doing an adaptive reuse, and that's a very specific Park Service term. We are changing the building's use, but we are keeping the historic character. We are going to turn it into 25 permanent supportive homes. I'll explain that in a few slides. And the main floor will be offices for uh, supportive services for those individuals living in the building and the general houseless public. The Bats Block uh, Apartments uh, will be, this building was built in 1913. It's a type of architecture, late 19th century, early 20th century. We've done it four times. I'm going to gloss over it a little bit, but we know what we need to do. And we have Pete and Lindsay and John on speed dial so that we do it the right way. But this to what Peter said, the bats block is a gem. I mean, it yes, it was boarded up on the first floor. We had no idea how much prism glass was still there or walls, <laughs> um, but we knew the general architectural styles and we knew we had something behind there and we'd have to replace some things and create some new, but 
the brick was in great condition. And to his point, there wasn't structural damage. There wasn't fire damage. There wasn't water damage. There weren't major missing pieces. A gem of an old building that lives in most of downtown uh, Montana towns. So when I talk about resident services, um, this is pictures here of we had a lot of storage in the building. Uh, it had been boarded up since about uh, 2019. It was in similar condition as Peter described. This is a picture of what it will look like when we have resident services located on the first floor. Opportunity Inc. and other service providers in Great Falls will be there to provide optional services for the residents um, of the Bats Block building. I'll get into some more detail about that in a minute. I will say, similarly, on the first floor, there wasn't a lot left. There wasn't a lot of contributing. It is all about the exterior facade, path of travel, first floor. We had a little bit of flexibility. On the second and third floor, that's where we're turning it into 25 homes. Uh, that's where we had more restrictions that we knew we would have because we'd worked with the Park Service before. Uh, we were going to maintain these open stairwells and path of travel down the long corridor, similar to what Peter said. Um, we were going to have to keep all the doors, and we were going to block off probably half of them because everything the Park Service cared about was that interior corridor and that repetition down the hallway. And so it was really easy. Um, we did a few other things to make it clear doors were front doors and the doors that didn't work, or we are in the process of doing that. I talked about the supportive housing. Um, this is a model that's working around the country. This is Homeward Second supportive housing project. It's for homeless, chronically homeless, at risk of homeless individuals coming in off the street, living in cars, and living in a lot of places around Great Falls. They will have homes and roofs over their head, and those service uh, providers on the first floor will provide optional services, case management, and connect uh, individuals with resources. A greatly needed project in Great Falls. We've completed a new construction one in Missoula, and that it's operating right now. Neighbors Great Falls has been working with all the caregivers in Great Falls, to, knowing that they needed this project, and has a, they're the great connection on that piece. This is what you guys really came for. Um, I think that Peter's probably more fun at parties than I am because I use a lot of different tax credits, and we talk about IRS requirements, but I think if you uh, corner each of us, um, we can kind of give you the detail. This is the capital stack. Um, I know Peter did his project 10 years ago. My projects 10 years ago had a much smaller capital stack. This is a capital stack, the result of COVID impacts to construction, material, labor, all the things, delays, and a lot of one-time monies. So I'm going to talk a bit about, we used the EPA Brownfield program. We were changing that building, used to be a hotel. It had various commercial uses on the first floor. So when we do the adaptive reuse, we are turning it into apartments. Um, we have that interior corridor, it looks the same, but once you get outside or into the apartment side, we took individual rooms and broke them into different apartments. And so um, we are changing the use, it had never been apartments, so uh, we were eligible for the Brownfield program that helped clean up all the asbestos, um, lead paint, anything that was in the building. Um, we got a part grant, a uh, part loan that we'll repay. The federal historic tax credits are very similar to uh, what Peter was talking about, um, that is a 20% credit on the qualified expenses. It's super valuable. Um, we can sell that to outside investors, inside Montana investors. State historic credits, we happen to be able to use it on BATS because Glacier Bank bought our tax credits. Um, and they are a Montana company, and we didn't have to worry about it not being non-transferable. We can explain that later when we have more conversation. The big, the big dog in the room is the housing credits. The state housing credits are a federal credit, similar to the federal historic credits. But unlike the historic credits, we, have, we give a credit to an investor for 10 years, once a year for 10 years, and we have a 15-year compliance. So these are the guys that care about everything and drive the boat. So when I know I have a building of civil, similar nature. I know I can meet the Park Service credit requirements. I can do everything Peter said because we've been through it and he's exactly right on all the things you have to fight it through. And then I call Lindsay and say, oh my gosh, we need to be on the National Register. Uh, we need to get you know John Bounton and Lindsay helping us out because we were so focused on the timelines of our housing credit that are more restrictive. Um, 
we had to kind of go a little quicker than we normally would. So again, I apologize to them several times and thank them profusely for helping us um, uh, as we got to this conference. But those housing credits, I did write down the numbers. I know I didn't put, you know, big spreadsheets on the on this slide, but those are those are credits sold to Glacier Bank, use them in Montana for federal and state liability. This is housing money. Uh, NeighborWorks, or NeighborWorks Great Falls had a little bit of proceeds from a, a program called the uh, Neighborhood Stabilization Program. They recycled in the project. Montana Department of Commerce awarded us housing trust funds and home investment partnership. Housing trust funds are for uh, homes that you build that you charge 30% of every area median income, so they're very low individuals. Uh, and so it fit perfectly with um, the houseless project, permanent supportive project that we were proposing. Cascade County gave us some of their COVID money. Uh, they got ARPA funds and they were like, wow, that's for houseless need. We don't know what to do with it. And we said, we know what to do with it. So they're one of the first funders in the door. So a shout out to the Cascade County. City of Great Falls awarded home and home ARP. Home ARP was a COVID home housing fund. We were able to get funds from the city of Great Falls. Similar to Peter, we used uh, Great Falls, uh, the tax increment financing. Uh, it's usually street facade, street improvement dollars. Uh, they're doing some work out on the sidewalks in front of the building. Federal Home Loan Bank is a housing program. They love historic preservation and adaptive reuse. So when we put all this together, they were like, yes, we'll fund you. It wasn't that simple. It took like a year. But um, we were able to leverage outside money to come into Montana. And the Montana Healthcare Foundation gave us some money for certain things associated with the houseless um, project that we were proposing. Mathematically, um, that's what it took to insulate ourselves from all the unknowns about construction right now. So it's usually not this complicated, but if you were there yesterday, you, you know that it's our other projects are probably about this many sources to get these projects to work. Um, the housing credits, when we apply and a lot of the housing money, we are limited on the rents we can charge. Uh, we only charge individuals 30% uh, of their income, and you have to be 60% area median income and below. So we're not getting a lot of extra money to cover the expenses, and so we can't afford a big mortgage on this project because this was a houseless project. There's no commercial mortgage on the rest of our projects. We can put as big a commercial mortgage as we can afford with those limitations on the rent that we collect. That's the benefit we give back to the community is that they are deed restricted affordable. Um, trying to think what else would be super helpful. The housing credit money, the federal housing credits, uh, federal historic credits on this project were 1.7 this million. The state housing credit uh, gave us about uh, 375,000 in equity. Um, the housing credits gave us 5 million in equity to work on the project. And then the other sources um, were various and we can get into detail, but I really wanna focus on the tax credits. Really wanted to talk and the reason we're here today explaining how important this program is, is that we can give some community benefits, right? We can help with the houseless issues in Great Falls. We're putting roofs over people's heads um, so that they are stable at night. Our other projects are more um, just rental homes for anybody that qualifies from an income standpoint. And we have those projects scattered throughout the state. I would say that's the touchy-feely side of what we do. But what I'm doing here, too, we did the math when we went to the revenue interim revenue committee when they were wanting to cut the state historic credit. And for $375,000 of revenue they weren't going to get, they're getting a, a whole stack of capital. And I'm paying $12 million into the Montana economy with this project. I'm paying Guy Tobacco locally. I'm paying B Spark locally for, well, one for construction, one for architecture, accountants, the tax, you know, the tax accountants, the insurance, all of it. There's only about ninety thousand dollars of this entire project leaving the state. So that was a pretty good argument to make um, with them. So again, twelve million dollars invested in Montana. Blue Bunch Flats is a project where. We had a little bit of fun. Um, we were doing a different architectural style. We were developing the old Livingston Memorial Hospital. You can see from up here, it, it kind of looks like it's five big legs. We can't get good pictures of it. It's been killing us. But 
Um, we did this uh, project kind of closed out during COVID, but on this project, we have 37 new rental homes. There were several units that were in a new part of the building that didn't count. The rest of it was qualified for the federal and um, state credit here. We invested $9 million into Montana for an offset of the state not getting about 300,000 in state credits. On this project, we could use the state credit. It's because U.S. Bank was our investor, and U.S. Bank loves to invest in us because we do all the community benefits, meet their CRA needs, but also um, have you know the good projects. So we got better tax credit pricing than most, but it was on the housing credits. They also had a state tax liability, so they could, and they had a state entity that could take it. So we did the federal and state historic credits here. So it worked the way it is. Very rarely can we use the state historic credit because we use um, investors from outside typically. Glacier Bank, we've been coaching and they are taking on buying credits. So that's what made it possible for BATS. Crowley Flats is a project that um, Jenny put in their report um, around the state credit. Um, we did not use state credits on this project in downtown Lewistown because we had an outside investor, Redstone Capital. They were, yes, we'll buy this 16 unit project in downtown Lewistown. We will buy your credits federally, both on the housing side and the federal historic credit. Again, same era. Uh, we have a project in downtown Billings, very similar to this. Bats is the same age, wonderful little project. But because Redstone investors and their investment pool uh, didn't have Montana tax liability and we couldn't transfer it, even if Glacier was participating in it, which they were, uh, we just couldn't use it. So that's some of the work that I want to see uh, help Jenny with and make sure that we are uh, making the ho state housing credit a little more exciting. 16 units, $5 million invested in Montana. So I, I, I make that argument. We were... I'll tell you this, and we'll talk a little bit about advocacy. I have a hard time working at the legislature because you know it's we have plenty to do, and you know sometimes it's difficult. But it was really important to go over and testify, and so we go through this big speech about twelve million dollars, nine million dollars, five million dollars, very little offset from the state credit, and they were asking to cut it. And I I think you two remember this, and Pete, you were there too, but the Billings rep. I, I don't have a good poker face. So he's he just leaned back in his chair and he said, you know, when I was walking down Montana Avenue shoulder to shoulder with hookers, I was like, I don't know where we're going with that. In my head. Um, he, he, he said, I've seen Homeward's Project, the Acme Building, downtown Billings, the housing authorities reinvested in downtown, private businesses have used these credits and there is no longer a problem in downtown billing, so I'll support it. And I'm like, I don't care how you got there. <laughs> but it's really important because every year they try to cut it. And so it's really important to do these types of projects, uh, to be able to deliver homes in downtown communities or in a city block in Livingston. This was fun. You can see the colors down the hallway. Um, that was a traditional wayfinding because you get you get lost in that building. We got lost several times, um, but the colors down the hallway match what we painted the uh, fire sprinkler in their units. So you know you're going home the right way if you're on the right color path. It was a neat trick, but it was really fun. So this was a unique. What matters? What doesn't? That big wide corridor mattered. Repetitious doors, but the rest of it we could do some pretty modern things on the inside. Um, going back, you can see again. There's all that all the funding that went into that project. I'm trying to think if there's any points we made to the interim committee, we should tell this group, but um, this is not a typical capital stack. Um, it's very similar to Peter's process. He doesn't have access to the housing, nor does he want to have to live with the 50 years of restrictions we're putting on ourselves here. Um, but it's another example of how the federal and the state um, historic credit can really turn these buildings into valuable assets for communities. We also like building in downtowns because it's close to jobs and grocery stores and where people work and they can walk places instead of um, compromising open space with sprawl. Uh, so this is this is more fun. Um, it's more complicated, but um, we're I think we're all here now to talk about tax credits and any questions the group has.